Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Nick. I'm the uh, founder of Whisk. We're a food AI platform um, that essentially helps other businesses create smarter and more connected food experiences. Um, I founded the company about seven years ago, or even eight years ago, um, and was acquired by Samsung about six months ago. So I'm a, a new member to the Samsung family, um, but um, a lot of my kind of history in this space and the food space has, comes from um, working with players outside of Samsung um, and around the world. Um, so today I thought I'd talk a little bit about what we have built um, to date, how developers can use it, how Samsung uses it, and a little bit about the learnings of the food space. Um, so if anybody here is looking to build food apps and experiences, um, hopefully you'll find something useful in this um, uh, 20 minutes. So for people who've never heard of Whisk before, um, we work with some of the largest recipe publishers, grocery retailers, CPG brands, um, and health companies like the National Health Service um, in, the, in the UK. Um, we power about half a billion monthly um, interactions across all the different connections that we have. Um, essentially, we have like an API layer, and that API layer is used by people building recipe apps, meal planning apps, um, shopping list apps, uh, to essentially connect with each other uh, and connect with, with content, recipe content, at scale. I thought I'd start today with a little bit about why I actually founded Whisk in the first place. Um, this goes back about seven years ago, and as I was starting to cook more, I realized I was spending a huge amount of time looking at recipe content on recipe sites, uh, platforms like Instagram, um, but actually cooking the same recipes again and again, and I kind of wondered why. And really, it came down to when I find something I want to cook, I have to then figure out when am I going to cook it, what ingredients do I actually have already in my kitchen, um, go to the retailer or go to the grocery store with a shopping list, um, buy my things, come home, realize I've forgotten a bunch of items, go back to the store. When I finally am ready to cook my recipe, often what happens is something a little bit like this, where I look at a picture on the website and it looks very, very nice, um, but the reality is, it's burnt, undercooked, missing ingredients, has different ingredients in it that I wasn't planning and I kind of found as I went through. Um, and really, when you look at the data, 89% of millennials say they want to be better cooks. Um, this is not just me. Um, this is definitely a problem that happens in, across households um, across the world. Um, the other trend that we, you, you look at when you look at the data is people are spending hours looking at recipe inspiration, but actually cook the same seven to nine recipes on repeat. Um, and that, that number changes around the world. The average is seven in some countries and nine in others. But generally, it's seven to nine recipes that people cook on repeat. So when we looked at this and go, OK, well, why is this? Um, it's actually not that surprising. If you take the journey from inspiration to all the way through to tracking food, um, that activity happens across many different players. So even just in the recipe um, inspiration space, there are hundreds of publishers that you're likely to use. It happens across many different retailers. Um, the, average, the average changes by country, but between four and five retailers that most people use to buy their groceries. Um, so it's pretty, um, it's, it's the, the activity is pretty spread out. Um, it's also done on different devices, so it's done on, the, on, on, de on tablets, on mobile phones, on voice assistants more and more. Um, it happens across lots of different devices, and it happens in different places. So you do it on your commute to work, you do it on the way back from work, you do it at work, um, as much as uh, your employer might not like that, um, and you obviously do it at home. Um, so it happens in lots of different places. So what we kind of um, uh, realized in trying to solve this problem is that it really comes down to data, um, and how you can use data to connect all these different experiences together. So today I'm going to talk a bunch about data and the importance of it and what you can do with it once you create it, specifically in the food space, but the, the, the lessons I hope are, are um, transferable to other spaces as well. So what we do is we use deep learning based natural language processing to essentially understand all the data that, that, that we, we try and process. So on the recipe um, side, there are, we pro, today we process about three million recipes uh, on a monthly basis. Um, and essentially every recipe is a bunch of text. It's an it's unstructured document. We create structured data from that unstructured uh, text. So if you've got a line that says three tablespoons of finely chopped fresh mint and coriander, we break that down into what is the amount that you need, 
what is the instruction that's going to happen to this. Okay, it's going to get finely chopped. So it's important that you have fresh um, and you, the ingredient is that you've got mint and coriander. The same is true on the retail side. So you'd expect retailers to have amazingly structured data. The reality is absolutely not that. Um, they have basically text lines that are descriptions of products, but very little data below it. So what we do, again, we use deep learning based natural language processing to parse that data out and create a level, a layer of structured data um, on top of all the, all the uh, store products that these retailers have. So once we do this, we map all this together um, into what we call um, our food genome, which essentially is a, a food graph. And on this graph, we have how popular are all these different ingredients in all the content and within all the products that we have in the platform. So across all these three million recipes and, and across these um, half a billion interactions a month, we look at what is the nutrition of every single item in here. So what's the nutritional quality of mozzarella cheese versus a different type of cheese? Um, how does it um, interact with people's allergies or diets? Um, and sometimes there are a whole uh, uh, re relatively complex filtering um, filters or, or algorithms to look at how does it apply to, for example, a Kalo, di um, a Kalo diet or, a, or someone who's got diabetes. And we work with some of the big diabetes um, companies, both the manufacturers of devices as well as the um, online uh, app-based solutions in the space doing exactly that. And then things like perishability, super important for Samsung with the fridge. Um, how long does an item last if you put it uh, in the freezer versus in your fridge versus into your pantry? Um, or if you're UK, the word is cupboard. Um, what is the, what's the flavor information about every item? Um, so what's the chemical breakdown of the item in flavor compounds? Um, and what is the availability in stores? So um, where can you buy it? How much can you buy it for? Um, different products are available in different areas at different prices. So, um, once we've got this, um, the, the mapping everything onto this food graph in the middle, what we can then do is we basically create a view of recipe content that is very, very structured. Uh, and this is just an example of it, but you basically have nutritional information, um, you have um, every single, all the tags about a recipe. Some of those tags come through um, taking that structured nutrition data and, and creating some basic filtering. Others are um, through um, clustering algorithms, so more along the machine learning side. Um, we have health scores, um, how healthy is this recipe, um, and lots of information about categories and other information about content. One of the things that I found really fascinating about this space is as you start to create more and more data, you can start to layer other sets of data on top of it. And if you're someone who works a lot in um, machine learning or deep learning, um, you'll, you'll know this is commonly used um, on, the, on the algorithm side, but also actually just on the filtering side. So this is an example on the filtering side where you know, we create a health score that parses a lot of very, very complex macro and micronutrient information about every recipe and every product and create a very simple score out of it. Actually building this score is quite simple. Um, what's really, really hard is doing all the natural language processing and then mapping onto a food graph. Once you've got that, actually a lot of stuff becomes quite simple. So um, by connecting all these different partners along the journey from inspiration through to tracking, um, essentially what we do is we build up a picture of the user. And we take roughly three groups of three areas of data, their preferences. So what does a user like or dislike? Um, do they have any allergies or diets? Um, do they, uh, uh, what kind of family size do they have and what appliances do they have in their home? Look at behavior. So what are they actually, what are they looking at versus shopping versus cooking? Um, and how does that differ? And we look at um, things around them, context. So what do they have in their fridge if they have connected their family hub? Um, what are, what are they, uh, what, what's the weather like where they live? And how is that going to impact? Um, I know the weather channel is somewhere at SDC. And we use some of their data for that. Um, and then we have a lot of data because we have all these integrations across all these different publishers, these half billion integrations. We actually know what's popular where you live. So we know if you live you know, here in San Jose versus in Berlin, um, you likely care about uh, different recipes. And you also care about different events. Um, like in, over in, in, in Europe, where I'm from, um, we don't really care about Thanksgiving uh, very much. You guys care a lot about it um, over here. Um, one thing that we found with personalization is that if you get just one or two things wrong, your whole recommendation is totally off. So for example, if you have a recommendation for someone um, you know, on, on, a, on basis of health and you get, uh, they've got diabetes and you give them the perfect recipe for diabetes, but you get the skill level wrong and they have no idea how to cook it, 
they're not going to make it. Or you get the cost wrong, and it's double what they usually spend on dinner. They won't, they won't make it. Um, if you get the time wrong, and you're suggesting something that takes two hours to, to do with a whole bunch of appliances they don't own, and they've only got 30 minutes, there's no way you're going to uh, get them across that line of actually choosing that, 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 that dish to cook. So what we found, actually, is that building out this really holistic view of a user is super, super important. Um, uh, in order to create recommendations that truly work and that truly get, uh, uh, you know, create en engagement. So I thought what I'd do is I'd show you a couple of examples of how this is actually how this actually works. Um, the first example um, I'll show you is a very simple example, and it's um, one of our big publisher sites. So we integrate with lots of different publishers um, in the U.S., U.K., Europe, and more recently in Asia. And this is an example from there. So this is um, Pillsbury, one of the big CPG brands. And they have this simple buy ingredients button, which um, is powered by Whisk. Um, you click shop, you choose your retailer, and it matches all the right products. Now, it's not doing a simple search here. It's using the foods graph and all your preferences, um, all the different tags on the data to make that match. And as the user um, changes their items they choose, if we recommend normal lemons and they choose organic lemons, we start to learn what, does, what kind of product does the user actually want um, and next time they get a much more personalized experience. The next example um, is from um, CES, and it's a Samsung example. So Whisk has actually been uh, working with, with Samsung for about four years. Um, and this is um, from CES 2018, and it shows the whole journey pretty well. And it's also got some sound. Hey everybody, Carl here from After at CES 2018, and we're in the Samsung booth with Andrew, and Andrew's gonna show us how to be healthier. Yeah. What are we looking at? So over here, this is your Shape Your Health booth. Um, ultimately, we're looking at the combination of different devices and services provided by Samsung uh, to give you a healthier and easier means of cooking as okay. well. So starting off right over here, I'm gonna demonstrate the Bixby Vision, All right? Simply open up the camera app, go over to Bixby Vision, Within Bixby Vision, if I hover over a food item, not only will it recognize what that is, but it will also give you a calorie count right here. Okay. So I could actually snap this picture to kind of say that I ate this today. Okay. Uh, once I snap it, it's going to upload the information up to S Health. Right after here, we're going to move right over here, and this is our virtual activity. Right, so I ate my food, now I want to work out. Okay. Right, so using the Gear S uh, watches, you could actually track how much calories you burn. So let me expand it up for you guys. And we're going to do a virtual activity right now. So I like running. I'm going to go run. It's kind of like a little game. So the original plan was to have bicycles, um, but they realized that no one wanted to be sweaty at a big conference. So I burn 146 calories, right? Yeah. Once we see that, once again, this information will be uploaded to S Health. So let's move over to the Family Health. So all the information that we uh, collected in the S Health, it actually shows up on the Family Health. This is how much I ate. This is the food item I ate. It also shows you how much calories I burn. Okay. And then it, we take it even further, right? It gives you calories remaining and food uh, recipes, recommendations based on my calorie counts. So we have a lot of different items here, and uh, I'm feeling chicken parmesan. Um, so if you notice, I ate this today. I'm about to eat this, and it gives me a recommendation for later today as well to match up to actually finish how much calories I need. Okay. Not only that, we actually could plan out a couple days in advance to do the same exact thing. All right. All right, so going to chicken parmesan. Here, we can see that um, not only does it make it a lot easier um, with instructions on how to cook your items, you have ways to actually um, see your inventory levels and go through shopping cart as well. But we actually um, combined or connected this to the oven as well. So when I click confirm, it's actually going to automatically start my oven to get to that 450 okay. degrees. Wow. Yeah. And that's the whole demo. So. With this whole journey that's actually pretty disconnected um, across all these different uh, players, devices, um, uh, and places that people do all, the, all, this, all this activity on inspiration to cooking a meal. Um, actually, what's pretty cool about Samsung, and one of the reasons why um, I thought selling the business to Samsung would actually be a really good idea, is that Samsung has such a, a wide range of hardware that actually does span that whole journey from inspiration um, through to tracking. Um, and I think actually, uh, while 
For users, we're giving them better meals. There are actually some really big global problems too around food waste and, and eating healthier um, that Samsung can start to tackle by, by, by pulling together um, the portfolio of hardware they have. So the way that it works um, every, is exactly the same as our third party integrations that we have, um, is that every single um, app um, essentially builds their own experience. Um, so each experience is built by every single uh, team. Um, it's not something built by one central team. But what you have is this, this um, open food platform that connects everything together. So if you go and create a shopping list um, on one device, it'll appear on the other device. If you go to a recipe site um, like Pillsbury or Food Network and you click Add, it'll appear on your fridge or it'll appear on your um, uh, other device you've connected. If you tell Bixby you want something, it'll appear on the other partner. So everything connects together. What the open food platform is essentially is a, a set of APIs where you can store a user's preferences in food, their shopping list, and their saved recipes. The, sec the second thing that we provide is this um, food AI platform, which is basically a suite of APIs where anything you want to do with reasoning on recipes or reasoning on a shopping list um, or grocery products, everything comes out the box with a set of APIs. So if you want to pull down content or you want to connect with lots of big grocery retailers, you can do that um, in the platform as well. And then that works together with platforms like SmartThings and Bixby, um, already um, uh, with Samsung for a while, um, to connect all the different devices and connect through to voice. So the vision that we're working towards, and we're not there yet, is that a user will be able to go to their TV, click Save, then go through to their mobile phone, um, scan a, a book, and save the recipe automatically. They might finish their workout, and they have a, get their Galaxy Watch, um, which tells them what recipe they might, they, that they could cook um, or, or make in the case of a smoothie. And they go to their fridge, and the whole shopping list is there, um, uh, ready for them to purchase and then for it to be delivered. Or a user starts a shopping list on a family hub. Um, their partner um, is in store doing that grocery shopping right now, and they realize, actually, I want to remember another item to buy. Um, so instead of ringing them up, they just tell Bixby, add this product to my shopping list, and the person gets notified while they're doing the grocery shopping. So I mentioned we have these two sets of APIs, the, um, the APIs to basically reason around content and the open food platform. Um, super happy that we're all um, uh, announcing that we've got uh, the open food platform hackathon, which we're running in February um, in 2020. Um, what this basically will be, it will be, it'll be a globally distributed hackathon. Um, people from around the world will take part. Um, we're hoping that we'll have lots of people here taking part, developers um, from around the world, as well as Samsung divisions. Um, we'll have uh, uh, challenges set by some of the big food leaders um, around the world and delighted to have Upwork um, as a gold sponsor on this. And if you haven't used Upwork before, um, I've, I've, I've been a big fan of them for six, seven years, um, building uh, a lot of the talent in my team actually was hired through Upwork. Um, so I recommend checking them out as well. I think they're actually at our booth um, over in, um, in the other room. The prize, um, thousands of dollars uh, we, we have. We have the, the top prize is $5,000 currently. Um, uh, we may have some other, well, we will have some other prizes we're announcing um, over the next few, uh, well, months probably. But at the moment, it's $5,000 is the top prize we have. Um, and that's all from me. Uh, any, I think we probably have a few minutes for questions if anybody does have any questions for us. Anybody? Yep. So, yeah, great. So the question was, um, just so uh, I've got the mic and you haven't, um, the, uh, was how do we uh, assess a user's skill in cooking? Um, you know, is it minced or that they can mince something or not? Or is it, um, you know, how, how do we do that? So the first way we do it is through, um, which is the, le the less accurate one, is the, there is an option in our platform, and apps can integrate this, and some apps do, to ask the user, how good a cook are you um, on a three-point scale? Very, very high level. Um, the, the, the reality is, um, with all of the, and this comes down to the point of this whole personalization model, is um, we look at the content they're using. So we look at what are they saving into their box, into their recipe box, what are they uh, shopping, uh, what are they uh, viewing. And through that, we know this recipe, we know all the, because we have all the structured data and, and all the data we laid on top, we know um, what 
techniques do you need for every recipe? Um, what devices do you need for every recipe? And through that, you can start to infer that someone, if they, if they have a lot of uh, sous vide recipes, they probably have a sous vide machine at home. Um, if, it have stuff, if it has lots of slow, slow cooking stuff, they probably know how to slow cook something. So that's kind of the more accurate way. Um, uh, that also t requires a lot of user interaction uh, to, make, to make it work. Um, so the simplest way to quickly filter uh, some relevancy is through a question, um, but then uh, refining it over time through looking at what they interact with. Yeah, one more question. <laughs> Um, the question was, do we have any plans for feedback mechanisms? So what happens if they're trying something and they keep failing it? Um, different apps that build on top of our platform do have that. Um, so you know, we, I showed that list of partners at the beginning. There, lots of them have that. Um, they, we don't, in our APIs today, have a way of doing that. But our partners you know, they often build features on top of our APIs that are just unique to them, and they handle those things there. But today, we don't have that fee feedback mechanism in the platform. Um, but it's definitely something I can imagine we might have in six, 12 months. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Support for languages. Um, so today, the platform works, I think it's 10 languages. Um, we're definitely in a lot more markets than that. Um, we're probably in about 25 markets. The key languages for us are English, obviously, because uh, that's where we, start, we started. Um, and then we have German. It works in, uh, in, in German, French, Italian, Korean. Uh, as you can imagine, it's pretty important for Samsung. Um, uh, so we have a bunch of different languages, and we, we recently, I think last week we launched, or not last week, last month, uh, we released Spanish, um, uh, both Spanish for Mexico and Spanish for Spain. Um, so we're always adding new languages on top. And the, the question really often is, well, the, the important question is, how deep do you go in that language? Um, because you know, having a, a, a list of ingredients and their expiry dates in, in 30 languages is actually pretty easy if your list is 1,000 items. Um, using, having the deep learning natural language processing working well um, and all the, uh, the, the different kind of clustering algorithms working to, to, to create all the tags on every single piece of content, that's a little bit harder. Or oh, actually, it's, a, it's significantly harder. Um, so that, does, that works best in the languages I just mentioned. Um, but it, for the other languages, we have some basic functionality that works as well. Any other questions? Cool. Well, Enjoy the rest of your SDC. Thanks.